Good. Well, look, as I'm sure everybody realizes, none of us know yet whether we're at the end of this crisis or simply at the end of its first phase. I suspect, tragically, we're probably at the end of its first phase. And the two phases will be different. Will be will share in common. I imagine if the second phase comes, massive attacks on welfare provision and serious job depletion, particularly for working class and lower middle class people on both sides of the Atlantic. But there will be one difference, I think. If the second wave of a recession comes, it will be driven out of Europe back into the United States through the transnational banking networks to link the two sides of the Atlantic. The one I'm going to talk to you about, of course, was driven out of the United States across to Europe. Um, it, came, it was a product of particularly Euro, uh, American malpractice in various ways. So we're, we're, what, I, what this talk will do, I hope, will refresh memories or create memories, whichever, uh, of the first phase of, um, of the financial crisis that broke around us in 2007-8. So the first thing I want to do is to tell you about the American story very briefly. I'll ask you to keep the American timeline in front of you so you have it. I'll then go through the, the, the parallel UK story, which these things should take maybe five minutes each, and then start the comparative exercise, which hopefully will then provide you with some intellectual equipment, which I'm sure you most of you already have, um, on how to analyze both sides of this transatlantic relationship in, in terms of political economy. So the US story first. I mean, the credit crisis began in the U.S. housing market in 2006 and 2007. After a decade in which house prices effectively doubled, and if you look at the diagram that is circulated with you, you'll see how that the house prices in the in the U.S. stay pretty flat for the bulk of the post-war period, and then suddenly they explode. There was this effective doubling of house prices, and many, many house owners here remortgaged their houses to sustain high levels of immediate consumption. People took out second, mortgage, second mortgages. At the end of that, two Bear Stearns hedge funds heavily engaged in the subprime part of this exercise unexpectedly collapsed at the end of July 2007, and then concerns spread through the entire financial system about the widespread sale of weak mortgages to house buyers, um, uh, to house buyers on low incomes, and about the associated danger of foreclosures, and they did so with good reason. I mean, in 2001, new subprime and home equity loans, that is the subprime and the second liens on your house, had totaled about 15 percent of all new residential mortgages, about 330 billion. Just five years later, that they were 1.4 trillion and 48 percent of all residential new residential mortgages. And that wouldn't have mattered, at least outside the housing sector, it wouldn't have mattered, mattered unless, um, um, had not these mortgages also been securitized, that is, bundled up and passed on to banks as investment instruments. And securities security collateralized, by, collateralized by mortgages increased in the US financial system from 18.5 billion in the middle of the mid-1990s to 507 billion a decade later. I mean, it just explodes the securitization process, and that could links the housing and the banking system kind of intimately together. And that in the process, the underwriting standards, what you had to be able to demonstrate for you get a mortgage, systematically went down. And, and <clears throat> as early as November 2007, Merrill Lynch was obliged to write off $8 billion in losses on mortgage-backed securities it had bought. And by the end of 2008, Amazingly, one house in ten in the United States was either in foreclosure or on the edge of it. So we had a major housing crisis linked to the banking crisis. And this foreclosure crisis in American housing then spreads through the entire banking and insurance system. And it leaves key players unsure about their own viability and crucially about the viability of others. And it actually brings down a series of leading financial institutions. 2008, if you look at the dates in that schedule, in January, the Bank of America is obliged to buy Countywide Financial, uh, main, who were the main private provider of subprime, subprime loans. Countywide Financial, of course, is the one part of the Bank of America system to this day, which is uh, delinquent and uh, dragging Bank of America down into massive debts and now facing huge legal claims against it for the things that Countywide Financial did. So I'm sure perhaps if you were not in Europe, you would have heard that this. Last month, the Bank of America, just anchored in Charlotte, is proposing to lay off 30,000 people. 30,000 people, you know, predominantly in the Charlotte area, the largest single 
uh, labor reduction in recent American corporate history, all because it was persuaded by Henry Paulson to take Countrywide Financial into his hands in January 2008. And then, of course, you get the crazy September. If you look at se the September data, terrifying. That was a, September was a terrifying month. Washington Mutual, which was the nation's largest savings and loan institution, it seized early in the month. Uh, Bear Stearns, um, to already totally collapsed by this point. Um, we saw the swallowing up of Merrill Lynch by Bank of America, and we saw the first of what were to be many tre treasury bailouts of AIG. We saw Lehman Brothers allowed to collapse. And what we also saw, of course, was the result was a complete grinding to a halt of the credit generating system in the U.S. banking network. And in that last quarter in 2008, U.S. GDP fell at 6.2 percent. I mean, it just, the economy actually went down, and two and a half million Americans began to lose their job. And of course, 2009 was worse. We lost six million more jobs. So nine million jobs have gone from this economy because of this banking crisis. And right now, I think for every American worker looking for a job, there's only a quarter job for workers for every job. So we have a huge unemployment consequence and so on. Now, the initial Bush response was simply to allow market forces to play themselves out. Initially, they treated the subprime loan crisis as, as a moral hazard issue. You know, you couldn't possibly subsidize other people's fecklessness, so you just had to grin and bear it. Um, and all they tried to do, and that's where Bank of America got caught, I think, was to persuade strong financial institutions to quietly buy out weaker ones, hoping it would actually stabilize the company. Um, but then, of course, they went through September, the wheels totally came off the bus. People were terrified, terrified that they got another 1929s on their, on their hands. And so, by the part, early in September, again, it shows you on the data, um, a, a blue chip Republican administration effectively took Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac into public ownership. They call it conservatorship, and they hit it around linguistically. But basically, the American state took over the American financing of the American housing system in one foul, foul, well, one sweep, you know. Um, and then, of course, Henry Paulson created the TARP bill, temporary uh, toxic assets recovery program, um, and actually uh, moved quickly to get money into the American banking system. The initial plan was to buy toxic assets. They found that was too difficult to do. So they used the money to recapitalize American banks, and, um, and also American, uh, both commercial banks, investment banks, insurance companies, hedge funds, and um, in that way tried to restore confidence in the credit system again. And in the process, if you look at the data in the American story later, if you go to the website, have a look at the article with all the facts and figures in there, huge amounts of money flows into the American banking system from the American te Treasury. Um, by the time Obama came to power, the U.S. Treasury had made $125 billion available to nine major banks, another $125 billion to smaller banks, and eventually would make $180 billion available to AIG. One of the little elements in the story, we don't have time to pursue this today, was at the same time they were trying to bail out the car industry, who were very reluctantly helping General Motors and so on, they gave them $17 billion. For that, they demanded huge restructuring, closure of plants, the removal of most of the large chunks of their um, uh, retail network, their distribution network. But to the banks, they just gave them the money. And one of the issues then became, you know, was this a Wall Street bailout that had no parallel to Main Street bailout, it became very contentious. But nonetheless, that, plus a huge amount of quantitative easing, which the Fed then began to make, the underwriting all kinds of loans, um, meant that enormous amounts of real and imaginary money poured into the financial system. In the, in the period after the September crisis. And the Obama administration came in, I was elected primarily because of it, I think, whatever Obama thinks about the quality of his rhetoric, but um, they came in and they inherited this mess, of course, and then they had to act on it. And they acted, and you'll see it in the data if you go further <coughs> into the American story, in four, on four fronts. On the housing front, what they did, which Paulson and the Republicans have not done, they created this thing called HAMP, <coughs> this program where they took some of the TARP money and they, they fed it into the ha housing system and enabled house owners to renegotiate their mortgages downwards, um, actually they effectively getting cheap interest, trying to pull the proportion of a family's income that went to pay off the house down to about 31% from the 39, 40% it was in at the time. So they, <clears throat> they, there's a big story there to talk about later perhaps. 
about how, what Obama said in February 2009 about housing and what the federal administration could do. And then subsequently, they strategically increased that. And in, in the um, <clears throat> presidential jobs bill, the American jobs bill that was brought in on September the 8th, there is one, one sentence in the, in the speech in which he proposes to do more of the same to get, because mortgage rates are now so low, of course, um, that they're actually trying to get people to re reschedule their mortgages, get them down to 4%, so that they actually are losing less money per month, and that would be, in effect, putting money back into the bottom of the American economy by increasing the available cash to houses, to the household sector. If you go to the website, I, I strongly recommend you go to my website because if you're having trouble sleeping, it's amazingly effective. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievably suffer. But we've been following the housing crisis on there. You'll see three or four entries in there. I mean, basic thesis really being that Obama's done too little, too late, and in a too uncelebrated fashion. It's been one of the great failures, I think, of the Obama administration. But nonetheless, they move on that front. They carry on the banking thing and they put the banks. Um, <clears throat> through stress tests in the, uh, early in the administration, and then I'm sure, sure people know eventually, eventually, they get to the Dodd-Frank's uh, re, uh, Finance Regulation Bill and act and fight their way through <coughs> difficult congressional battles with Blue Dog Democrats in the Senate and the House, but they, in the end you, you do end up with financial regulation on the books, with most of the details of that financial <coughs> regulation still to be negotiated, and then you get the midterm elections where the Democrats lose control of the House and the banking industry has been on pushback ever since. So there's an enormous story to be told about banking regulation. Um, but nonetheless, they did get the reform of the banking system through. And then, of course, what they did, the two other things they did, which are important to us now, they created a stimulus package to try and lift the economy back out of the recession. That came also in February 2009. It was about 900 billion in the end. A mixture of tax cuts and direct spending and kept um, a lot of the money got down to the state level, so teachers and policemen and firefighters and so on were actually kept in work, who otherwise would not have been, because most American state constitutions require that budgets be balanced. Um, and then, of course, that money w runs out in 2010, again coinciding with the midterms. And this year, you've seen, what, three quarters of a million teachers laid off and you know, across the country as a whole, huge kind of slaughtering of the public sector school labor force. And Obama came back last week arguing for an American Jobs Act, and let's do a stimulus again. But whether that's got any political legs, we'll have to see. But certainly a stimulus package, very ambitious American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, it was called. And then finally, they've been playing a role. They continue to play the role. Tim Guyton was playing the role in uh, last week when he came over to, to, to see the finance ministers of the European Union for quantitative easing, you know, for actually putting less weight on re-regulating banks to make sure they don't do that again, but actually using the banks to kind of free up credit. Because the big problem that the American economy's got is that the banks have tightened up on credit and on house lending. And, and so the companies are sitting on large amounts of money that they're not investing because nobody has the money to buy. And small businesses can't hire partly for that and partly because when they go to the bank, the terms on which the money is available to them is now so tight. We've got ourselves, that is, in the American context, into a Japanese grip. You know, the, ten, the lost decade of Japan. Banking system doesn't trust itself or anybody else, and because there's no trust, nobody actually can do anything, and therefore they don't trust themselves. And that syndrome is what we're trying to break ourselves out of now. So that, the, the American story is a very serious one. It comes off the housing crisis. It's linked to the banking system through securitization. And, of course, because banks are inter, international players now and because the American economy has been a, uh, a, ch ch a chosen uh, uh, I mean, place where people put their money. Uh, lots of European banks would come in, and this thing, that the toxic asset thing went right the way across into Europe, with, as I'm sure everybody knows, equally disastrous consequences there. But, if, but depending on how far the banking systems in different countries were exposed to the American the securitization process, and, how, and depending on the housing systems they were running, the impact of the first crisis varied. And, but it was uh, most severe in the U US. And then, we okay? The, you go to the UK story, the parallel is pretty close. But what's interesting about the UK story is it starts earlier. <clears throat> um, in, the U in the UK, the, by the time we get to the financial crisis of 2008, the United Kingdom has been under New Labour's government, New Labour government since 1997, with huge parliamentary majority through till 2005. The Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, 
Perot show that many of you may have a chance to study. Gordon Brown, of course, the Prime Minister, by the time this thing happens, I think, I think by the end of it, but, uh, but the Finance Minister prior to that. Um, and they've been pursuing, a, as we'll say later, a pretty similar kind of strategy, <coughs> so that in, uh, in the UK, as in the US, people have been receiving loans to finance, finance house purchases, the demand for houses had gone up, and house prices had soared. We left the UK in um, <coughs> 99, just to be anecdotal about it a minute, and our house sold for, I think, £125,000, about $20,000, something of that order. It's a very nice house in a northern suburb. And when we went back, it had, the price had almost tripled. Um, uh, the, the explosion in some of the housing markets was that, that was that sort of great. Now, I would never go back to England permanently. Anyway, I am an American citizen because the weather there is always like it is here today. <laughs> but even if we went back, we'd have to live in a trailer park. You know, I mean, the whole thing is just kind of gone because um, the houses have really gone up. Um, and what happened in the UK, and you'll see it on the September 2007 part of the chronology, a bank called Northern Rock, a mortgage lender, linked to Lehman Brothers, actually have been doing most of the subprime lending. And, it, and as um, worries built in the American system in 2007, it couldn't, uh, the interbank money decided to dry up and it depended so much on, on that sort of money. It borrowed short and lent long and it got caught. And there was a run on the bank in September 2007. There was a line. You all seen It's a Wonderful Life? Yes, you know the movie? You know, in 30, well, the, there was a line all the way around the bank, um, the headquarters in, the, in up in the north. Um, it was the first uh, rush on, run on the bank in the United Kingdom since the 1890s. It was a very traumatic moment former wife of mine lost all her savings, just like that. I mean, people paid a terrible price for that collapse, right? Um, <clears throat> she doubly pissed Joan off, actually, because I was also a reckless one who believed that you had to get in so much debt with your bank that you were too big to fail. That was always been my story. <laughs> I'm deep-seated Keynesian, <coughs> but she was a monetarist and had saved money like crazy, and unfortunately, she put in her own bank. Um, and then what happens is, it, initially, that's a localized problem, but of course, as, as Wall Street... Um, clams up, so do, does London as well. And London banks began to shut their doors, and of course when Lehman Brothers closes, it closes in London, on Canary Wharf, and it closes primarily because the unit that have been in London have been the ones that have been doing most of the um, speculating between uh, Northern Rock, and AIG's op problems were primarily problems in its London office and so on. But anyway, as in America, the credit system dries up in the end of 2008, UK GDP declines as well, um, and it falls all the way to 2008 and 2009. And just like the Fed, the Bank of England cuts interest rates and then tries different forms of releasing and underwriting credit programs so that quantitative easing goes on in both places. But unlike the um, Bush administration, when this thing breaks in the UK, you have a centre-left government in power. So it is not as wedded simply to market forces, um, and instead they move very quickly to go and guarantee deposit, depositors funds and they start to take troubled banks into public ownership. Northern Rock, they try and find a private buyer, as I remember, for Northern Rock, I think Richard uh, Branson, uh, um, Virgin, uh, Richard Branson of uh, Virgin uh, wanted to buy it. But in the end, Northern Rock is taken into public ownership and uh, the government also takes um, part ownership of Lloyd's and um, Bradford and Bingley and so on. Other banks come into its, its sphere of direct control and the Bank of England starts putting out special lending schemes and so on to try and get recapitalization going through the, um, through the English end of this banking network. Um, <clears throat> and as in the um, United States, quite quickly in, in 2009, the, the United Kingdom government generates an asset, asset protection scheme through which the Treasury would try and flush out um, the bank's to toxic, toxic assets in return for an agreement for them to lend. So there's much more direction in the British case. I think both sides of the water, people chewed over this, what they call the Swedish model then, actually creating a bad bank and moving all these toxic assets into the bad bank and having them manage it out as the Swedish banking system had done so effectively in the 90s. That doesn't seem to have happened in either case. But in both countries, as in, um, um, uh, in the UK, as, as in the US, uh, the, the central bankers put a lot of imaginary money into the system to underwrite credit in an attempt to keep <coughs> demand high and investment rolling. <coughs> now, just to wrap the stories up, 
there are some similarities, some differences in, in the emphasis in the, in the English end. One of the big differences in, is in relation to housing. The foreclosure crisis is by no means as deep in the British case, and there's much less action on housing. Um, and, and we can talk about the detail of that. They did have, eventually, an equivalent of HAMP, what they call a homeowner's mortgage support scheme, try, which helped people reschedule their mortgages. Well, HAMP wasn't very successful here. It was about 380,000 houses, I think, homes in the end, I think. But the Brits got to 34. You know, that was a scale, how limited it was. So that, I think there isn't, uh, the housing bit of the story is very much the American end. And though house prices explode in both places, housing policy is, not, is by no means as critical, I don't think, in the UK as in the US. But on the banking front, very similar moves um, to try and expand available credit and to start talking about re re tighter regulations. But, it, but there are a couple of differences that you may, we may talk about later, which are quite significant. One is um, that you know, in the middle of the crisis in the, in the UK, there is a general election and New Labour loses office. So the second half of this first story in the UK has a different government. It's a coalition government of conservatives and liberals, and they have a different kind of attitude to this whole thing. They're much more, uh, they're much less enthusiastic about letting more credit flow. They're much keener on. Um, bank regulation. And the other thing is that the, the as you, people will know parliamentary systems and um, the presidential systems with checks and balances work differently. We'll talk about that briefly in a second or two. So the Dodd Frank bill comes out of the Congress. Well, the British way, of course, is to set up a parliamentary commission or some commission of inquiry, the great and the good, to put a report together. The, that report, the Vickers report, came out last week. And they are proposing really very rigid ring, ring fencing around commercial banks, so they can't go do this investment bank speculation again that was so critical to the crisis. So the regulatory moves come later in the British case, but when they do come, they look like they might be a little more rigorous. And then the other thing that's changed in the storyline before we stop is that though initially, and Gordon Brown and the New Labour people were very, very committed to coordinated action between governments to, to stimulate the economy, to get rid of the recession by getting demand going again and letting borrowing take the pressure. Uh, the Cameron government has been entirely the reverse and has, and has been adamant that they had to have a, a, they had to cut their way to recovery. So that as soon as the Cameron government came in and uh, in, in the, after May 2010, after the negotiations with the Liberal Democrats were over, the Chancellor uh, George Osborne introduced an austerity budget, uh, cut public spending quite severely, and so now in the United Kingdom, teachers are being laid off, uh, welfare programs are being closed down. And as somebody sitting there with a piece of paper in front of them, but the IMF said two days ago, was it, that if Osborne's cutting so deeply, he's in danger of tipping the United Kingdom back into a second recession. He wasn't very pleased with the IMF saying that to him. Okay, so those are the two storylines, and you've got them in front of you. Uh, and what I want to do now is to just briefly talk about similarities and differences in the story, and then we'll go to similarities and differences in the causes, and, and then we can start talking to each other in a Q&A. I would ask you just to take a look, please, at the back of this thing. that, And you see that diagram um, from the work of Schwartz and Seabrook on types of <coughs> housing market. There it, let me just go back an inch to say this. The, for those of us who have been working on comparative political economy for now 20 years, in my case, unfortunately, um, you did, you know, uh, two things. You did um, t typologies of capitalism, models of capitalism. You did Peter Hall and David Soskis, all that stuff about varieties of capitalism. And you did Gossip and Esper Anderson and the Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism. You know, you did the different ways in which welfare systems are organized. And the one thing you never talked about was housing. I had absolutely no idea how housing systems were at all. Who the hell cared? You know? And it turned out, of course, it was the cuckoo in the nest. It was a thing we're all focused on. Well, um, uh, Sh um, Schwartz and, and Leonard Seabrook and, and a number of others, these are superb scholars, fabulous stuff. It's really amazing, important stuff. And they're trying in the piece you've got to see how their particular understanding of types of housing systems sits on uh, Gospin S. Anderson's typology of welfare capitalism. So it's, that, that piece is out of something else, but it does show you that 
uh, both the US and the UK are in what they term the liberal market quadrant of their comparative typology. And liberal market housing systems share certain characteristics, relatively high levels of private ownership, relatively high levels of mortgage debt in relation to GDP, easy and relatively cheap refinancing of mortgages, and the significant degree of securitization of mortgage loans. These are the four things that lead, bind these things together. Um, just as a, uh, how am I doing? Uh, I mean, one of the most striking differences, we might be able to say it later, but striking differences between buying a house here and buying a house in, in the UK, never mind buying a house in Germany or Denmark, the difference is here you're an idiot if you pay off your mortgage. You never, never pay off your mortgage because you get tax relief on your interest payments at the highest rate of tax, the highest rate of tax. So the government actually encourages you to buy as big a house as you can, and it subsidizes the bigger houses more than it subsidizes the cheaper ones. And then in 86, they changed it under a Democratic con con Congress and a Republican, one for Ronald Reagan, uh, they changed the tax code again so that you used to be able to get tax relief on the car you bought, right? Because of what's a shock, I don't know whether it's a shock to everybody, a shock to me. You pay tax on, on your car, on the, on the capital value of your car each year. They send you a tax bill. Bloody hell. Buy a new car, normally leaves you completely scrapped for cash. And then the swine tax you on it as well. But nonetheless, they do. But that came off a system where you got tax relief on that car payment. Well, they did away with that in 86. And they said instead, said instead that you could have tax relief on your second mortgage. So if you wanted to get a car, what you did, you went to the bank, got a second mortgage on your house, and took the money, said, promised you were going to use it for painting and decorating, and bought yourself a nice car, right? And there was a phase in the American housing story when, when the house was earning more each week than I was, right? And where people were using their houses like an ATM machine. You know, you just plug it in, get some more money out, and off to Bermuda for another cruise. I mean, that, that, the American housing system's final is, is ridiculous, you know? It's, uh, if, 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 if the beloved governor of Texas wants to find a Ponzi scheme, <laughs> I mean, I personally am now entirely in favour of the immediate secession of Texas, but that's another story. <laughs> um, anyway, the Brits, more sensibly, had this thing called Myrus, which was the similar thing, only you didn't get a second more years. Um, can you cover? But over the years of both the major government and the new Labour government, they took Myrus away, bit by bit, because obviously people have built their living standards on getting some tax relief. They took it, first of all, they dropped it. They set a limit, I think, on the amount of amount you could claim, you know, the price of your house, and then they dropped it to the lowest tax level, and then they did away with it altogether. So, there are the, you know, tax codes are extraordinarily boring unless you live inside them, and they're absolutely vital. Right? Um, and as Warren Buffett said, he knows exactly how to pay less tax as proportion of his income than his administrative staff do, and, and you've got to know these things. Trivic amplifying effect on the house prices from the crazy American tax system. But nonetheless, in relation to those liberal, mar liberal housing markets, the, there are three trends inside the, in the lead up to the crisis that are common to both uh, the British and the American situation. First of all, deregulation. There's a huge easing up of the rules that surround both banks and, uh, lend and, uh, uh, and, and also um, savings and loans. There's a savings and loans crisis in the US, which we could talk about too. That, so it's deregulation is one feature they have in common. Second is the growing securitization of mortgages, as we talked about at the beginning. And the third is this bubble, you know, the house price suddenly explodes and so on. And people were taking mortgages out, of course, assuming that they could remortgage when they, later on when the price was higher. What we're finding now, of course, is one American house in four is underwater, as they say. That is, you, you, you actually owe more on it than its market value currently is. So if you go back to the bank and say, can I remortgage, when they stop laughing at you, they throw you out. You know, I mean, that's so, I mean, effectively, remortgaging is finished. In the, <coughs> minute. the other similarity between the two cases is the way to finance in the economies and the fact that um, <coughs> the linkage, very strong linkages between the two US-owned and headquartered financial institutions, a real presence in the city of London. British banks, of course, play a major, but a very, if any of you have seen the films about Henry Paulson and Too Big to Fail, Barclays are trying to get in all the time, and uh, Alistair Darling plays a critical role. So there's a real link between the two centres, and both of them uh, experience this systematic deregulation at the t uh, uh, over time. And at the start of the crisis, both of them have these rogue institutions who are doing too much. The, UK, the US has countrywide financial, the, the 
UK has Northern Rock, these are little banks that are to become big banks by taking more and more of the mortgage market and so lending to more and more people on less and less adequate terms. And then the other thing that we they share in common uh, is the way in which in both economies there's this incredible freeze of credit um, and, uh, and the governments have got to come in and act very quickly to try and release funds to, to get the credit systems working again. Uh, and you get in both economies of political systems for a while, uh, what I th take to be an overwhelming popular desire to kill a banker. You know? I mean, some real anger with Wall Street, some real anger with the city of London, that when the savings and loans crisis had broken in the late 80s in the United States and the first George Bush had done exactly the same, bailed them out and spent a lot of taxpayer money, over a thousand bankers went to jail for fraud, you know, speculation beyond their rights and so on. Of course, not a single banker has yet gone to jail in the United States, so these things are now beginning to cook up here. Um, but I think one thing that we saw early on was a very strong anger about the fecklessness and, re and the recklessness of the speculating sector of the finance system. And of course, the outcome in both countries has been very similar. Two sectors of the economy have taken the bulk of the pain. One is the small business sector which has actually been unable to get credit and has actually had to contract dramatically. You know? So all kinds of people who work hard all their lives to create small businesses and keep them afloat and employ people have actually gone to the wall because the big boys were speculating with their cash. And of course the other huge uh, shared um, um, sufferers are the um, are, are vast numbers of people who lost their jobs. I mean, ordinary workers have been put to the wall in very large numbers. And we're currently stuck in this unemployment impasse. But there are differences, and I just wanted to just to draw attention to the differences before we then talk about the drivers and then clear the floor. I mean, one of the very big differences is the housing systems in both countries. And if any of you are going across to the UK, perhaps it would, or indeed, we go, wherever you're going in Europe now, I think being sensitised to how people organise and get their homes and so on is a really, really important thing. To look at, you know, I mean, you all live now, you know, in a rented sector, don't you? And, and you pay for your room, and your overwhelming desire is not to go back to your parents. I mean, I'm sure that's absolutely the driver of the whole of life, and it's the one thing you and your parents will have total agreement about. I imagine, <laughs> but you know, but but the, but of course, the rented the rented sector is exploding again in the U U.S. and people are building new rental units. You see it as you come into Greensburg, certainly in Winston Salem. But home ownership rates are going down and so on. Um, but in the UK, <clears throat> there's a crucial difference. The United Kingdom it has a land mass just a little larger than North Carolina. If you turn North Carolina on its side, that is the UK, 600 miles one end to the other. And they do have serious um, environmental control, town and country planning since the Second World War, crucial green areas, the Lake Districts and so on, where people are not allowed to build. Um, and so they've been increasingly building on floodplains. That's one of the reasons why has been such damage you know, when the weather's been bad lately because in fact the housing systems had to go out into areas you know it's a bit risky to build in but where else can you build but house building in the UK is largely fill-in building right? you do get these little Barrett estates uh, but what you actually do now is putting houses in between other houses and therefore the supply of the housing uh, on the is more restricted I mean there are 60 million people living in a space that's slightly larger than North Carolina we have, what, at least six or eight million people in this state? I mean, something of that order. So, it's a, as you know, it's one of the most densely populated areas in Northern Europe. Not the most densely populated area, but I mean, it's very dense. And the, the other thing, which perhaps is not relevant to this at all, but let me say, um, what strikes me as odd. They have fewer motorways, interstates, mile per mile, than we do. They have, I think it's 2,400 miles of interstates in the United, what they call motorways in the United Kingdom. And there are 32 million cars. So the M25 is the largest circular parking garage in the whole of Europe. You know, I mean, you can get trapped in those things. It's a very, very dense um, world, and and there had never been a secondary uh, mortgage market in the UK. There had never been Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So the big difference between the two systems, even before the crisis, is this: that most people, when they bought their house, bought their house on an adjustable mortgage. And indeed, that was one of the great mechanisms for controlling demand in the macroeconomic policies of got successive governments to alter interest rates because that would then feed through into mortgage rates and what better people would have lots or little money to, to buy. In the United States what Fannie Mae did when 
uh, established in the 30s was to standardize the fully amortized 30-year fixed mortgage. So you, know, you took a mortgage, it was at a fixed rate, and you, and you knew month for month what you were going to pay right the way through the 30 years at the end. That was never true in the UK. Uh, because the uh, mortgages went up and down, building societies were able to, uh, the equivalent of the savings and loans, were able to adjust their interest rates, of course, uh, so they were able to avoid the problem that the savings and loan systems in the United States ran into in the 80s when they were, uh, when interest rate, long term interest rates and short term interest rates reversed. And so they were actually lending long on rates that were lower than the short term rates they were having to pay to get the money to lend it you in the first place. And that's why the savings and loans crisis broke in the late 80s. Uh, well, there, there was no equivalent in the UK because of this much more common use of, of, of adjustable rate mortgages. Um, and therefore, the other thing to say in a, a, of a difference is that though the relationship between the two financial centers is close, there's a very real sense in this story I've been telling you this morning of the crisis being imported from America. It was not a crisis that was generated in the United Kingdom. And it certainly was not a crisis generated in the rest of Western Europe, as Nicholas Sarkozy is forever telling American bankers when he meets them at Davos. You know, it's your crisis and we're living downwind of it. Um, but of course, the European banks were keen to participate in the securitization process. The banks were active buyers of these things. And, and the US did have its own little Lehman Brothers Northern Rock scenario going on as well. But nonetheless, this is very much um, an imported crisis. And it, and it was imported into a banking system that was more more coherently regulated than, um, than the American one. I don't know if people can see this at the back. It's one of my favorite pictures. Um, this is a picture of four senior figures of the Bush administration, the four people who headed the four regulatory agencies overseeing the American financial system at the federal level. And what they've got is a whole bundle of bank regulations which they are attacking with chainsaws and chisels, all right, in order to demonstrate how keen they are to deregulate. And this guy with the, ch with the chainsaw was the chair, the head of the Office of Thrift Supervision. Um, uh, and the only bit of the Office of Thrift, thrift, thrift Supervision's title, which was misleading, was the supervision bit. Right? <laughs> and all the countrywide financial were with the others, and they moved to the Office of Thrift Supervision because they knew they'd have a more easy regulatory thing underneath them. Well, the only casualty of the Dodd-Frank Act was the Office of Thrift Supervision. They shut it down. It was just inexcusable what it had done. M uh, Mary King, the back governor of the Bank of England, not playing those games at all. And the FSA was not playing those games at all. In fact, as we'll see just as I close, one of the perversities is that the Bank of England spent the part of the crisis outflanking the Labour government on its left. Um, the, the Mervyn King was convinced that the, to control the banks, you had to break them up. He was in favor of separating commercial and investment banking again and making the banks smaller. And Alistair Darling, the new Labour Chancellor, say, no, no, don't do that, because otherwise all those American banks will go to Frankfurt. Right? You know? So you get these kind of paradoxical replays, re re relationships. But nonetheless, this was an imported thing. And of course, the crisis in the United States kingdom is narrow, it doesn't stretch out in the housing thing quite so much, so there wasn't quite as much to do. But the rhythm of the policy uh, was uh, rather different, and it, in the UK it started with public ownership, which doesn't really figure in the American story unless you look at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which were clearly taken into public ownership. Right. Quick, what time are we doing? Yeah, pass. Can I do 10 more minutes? Are you okay? People aren't going to say no anyway, even if they think it is. So let me just keep, keep Look, there are similarities and differences, and we have to understand why that they are. And I think, in terms of similarity, I just to put certain things on the table, the table that we might talk about later. Uh, later. For all the fact that New, the United Kingdom had a centre-left government, the underlying growth strategy that both the US government under Clinton and Bush too and the growth strategy that Gordon Brown, just like John Major, had pursued were very, very similar. And, and they were um, growth models on which you generated increased demand primarily by letting personal debt rise. That you, you were not, uh, the, 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 the debt model in the United, uh, sorry, the growth model, the New Deal growth model that fell to bits in the 70s here in the United States was one based on strong trade unions, 
high rising wages and productivity being distributed more evenly through the society as a whole. And that people made American cars and they bought American cars, and you got in that generation a living standards for blue collar workers who were unionized in the American Northeast and Midwest, living standards that were way above the Europeans. Well, that fell to bits in the 70s, and Reaganism came in, income inequality, outsourcing, and, and the release of large amounts of personal debt. And so the, the UK, not quite the same growth story, but, but it's still plastic. And if you actually look at what happens as a result of both 30-year uh, periods, levels of personal debt in both economies go through the roof. So what that really means in practice is you're getting economic growth now by people borrowing money, wages they hope to earn next year, off banks who charge them for the privilege of lending them fictitious money, right? And that money then keeps the thing going. Um, and of course, it's fine so long as you don't stop. And it's, it's always, in a sense, effectively wage cutting yourself because you can be paying 29, 30% rates of interest. Uh, the kind of levels of usury, indeed, in which um, uh, Jesus Christ once cleared the temple for, you know, became quite normal, right? You know, from the way you are on. Him, but nonetheless, you know, as a as a anti as a populist anti finance guy, I think Jesus Christ had a lot to be said for him. Um, and he would have had a ball in the city of London just ahead of the recession. The second thing, the similarity, the same similarity that goes with that is this: if you have a lot of people borrowing money, it tells you you have a lot of money to be borrowed. And that tells you about the weight of financial institutions in these two economies and also their ability to draw money in. I mean, the, the big thing that builds up, as again perhaps people know, globally, are these imbalances between economies that have massive trade surpluses um, and economies that have massive trade deficits. Now, inside the European Union, that's the story now being played out between Germany and the Mediterranean countries, particularly Greece, of course. Um, and, the, and some of the dynamics of that are different. But globally, Germany is one of the trading surplus economies, so is China, uh, but the, um, and so is Japan. Uh, but the trading deficit, people who actually can't make enough manufactured goods to satisfy their own people and borrowing, are actually the Americans and the British. And the American debt, America's moved from being the largest exporter of capital and the strong trade balance in the 50s now to be, of course, the major debtor in the system. So you are a hegemon who can't actually pay his or her own way. Now, the UK is in that condition as well, that their manufacturing sector has now shrunk to such a point that, they, in fact, they are in net, net borrowers. The, the American one is particularly acute. As you know, in the last decade, we have turned a small ch ch uh, trade deficit with China into, this is a Walmart defect, isn't it, uh, into uh, a, a huge trade deficit where the volume of manufacturing produce that coming out of China is now bigger than is being produced here in the United States. We just passed. Um, and I was doing work on that uh, a month or two ago and was quite shocked to discover we, of course, you know, import everything manufactured from China, a very large part of what we do. And our major export to China is waste paper. They send the stuff in boxes and we export the paper back. Um, I mean, that's how bad it has got in a decade and so on. And there's a parallels of that kind. It, and it tells you that there are structures in place that draw money into these two cities that the local e manufacturing economy would otherwise not sustain. Mm -hmm. and, and it tells you about imperialism. I think it tells you about the imperial role the United States plays, even the US institutions play, and that the uh, UK roles, uh, and, the, and the, U the UK used to do. But the critical thing for the storyline, the big difference is it's much easier to draw money into, into, into Washington than it is into London, and London always has to be very sensitive about the margin of its interest rates over Germany and so on to keep the money coming to London. I mean, as you know, Standard & Poor's decided at the end of the debt ceiling fiasco to downgrade the Treasury bonds, and the tre demand for Treasury bonds went up, you know, so screw you, S&P, you know, I mean, people did, knew well enough that these things were particularly but still stable. And that tells you about some differences, partly that accidental differences of who was in power when the thing broke, so that, I mean, that has had an effect on, you know, which party actually ends up picking up the pieces. But if we're not in the, we're, since we're still in the middle of this crisis, it may well be that the, the Obama f administration's failure to get rapid and effective purchase on the recession side of this crisis, to match the speed with which they got the money going into the banking system, may yet let a Rick Perry into the White House, or maybe the thing will go centre right 
in both cases, and therefore I, I will see you in Montreal at some point. <laughs> um, I, I can't overcome my aversion to Canadian snow. Um, but the, also, of course, these are different pl political systems. So, it's, I mean, and you see that uh, being played out in, in the way the legislation comes through. That's hugely important. And, of course, the UK is, whether it likes it or not, part of the European constellation of nations. I mean, it would like, of course, not I think, it's, it's political class would still like not to be. So the European dimension figures in the, in the UK response in ways it doesn't in the American, and that's where I think that story about the government of the Bank of England is particularly significant. And the weight of finance in the UK system is higher, actually, than the weight of finance in the American system. Um, so that, um, in, a, in a way, the UK will be doubly vulnerable to any continued bank crisis because uh, some, it depends on you, who you talk to, but Vince Cable is convinced that um, finance in the UK contributes nearly 30% of GDP, and Vince Cable happens to be the business secretary over there right now. I think we, we've all balked a bit on that number. You, know, you depend on other people's calculations to tell you, but nonetheless, the financial sector is critical to the UK even more than... Uh, than um, it is the US. And that may tell you partly about the relative size of military industrial complexes in each economy. There are things to talk about there that we might think. But the big difference, of course, is the global position of the two economies. The UK is no longer a global hegemon. It is, a, it is in its post-imperial moment. Uh, and it's having to find a new settlement in a multipolar world that would once have been led by the United States. So its strategic solution, which was to be a bridge between Europe and the US, starts to look less relevant now in a situation in which um, the European Union, for all its immediate problems, is a huge player in its own right, and where other the BRIC countries are coming into play as well. Uh, so they stand in a different place in relation to, to the global system, and that does actually affect how these crises are played out in each case. You have got data in, uh, from the newspapers in front of you, but let me just say to you that um, I take it we'll never get back on the housing side to being able to use AT houses as ATMs. I think you know, the, the housing but purchase will continue to be problematic. Um, the, the situation in the housing uh, market in the U.S. remains desperate. The Wall Street Journal this morning just produced a report that the Fed puts out uh, on the number of mortgages, um, <clears throat> and the Fed has just found that lenders originated just under 8 million mortgages in 2010. That's 12% down on 2009. We haven't had so few more new mortgages um, in this economy since uh, 2007. So, I mean, the thing is actually still stuck. That tells you a lot about involuntary unemployment. It tells you a huge amount about foreclosure, pulling down prices. It also tells you a lot about labor and mobility because people can't move. If they're moving, they're leaving their families behind, you know, and. There's plenty of research data coming out now on the adverse, terrible adverse effect of this recession on personal health, on mental health, on family stability, and so on. I mean, the, the downside of all this, not, the numbers are awful, but the reality, of course, is worse. So the, the housing thing is really deeply uh, embedded as a problem in the US and is a weight pulling the whole economy down. I don't get the sense from the data that the housing market is playing quite that role in the UK, but you've all got housing data in front of you. And it isn't, it isn't looking good, I don't think. So we'll ask people to have a look at their newspapers in a second or two and share the, what's there so people get completely up to date. What is common in both economies is, is that the financial institutions, the big ones, have definitely bounced back. They do look for the minute to be very profitable, certainly on Wall Street. I take it now the banking systems are terrified that they've got themselves overextended into Greece and into the, Euro, into the Eurozone so that if you know, we, we talk about saving Greece, but what we're actually talking about is saving the banks again, you know, because they're the ones with the debt. So the housing, the, 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 the minute Wall Street's gone back to paying itself these disgraceful bonuses, unbelievable bonuses, and just reinforcing the, the view, which I've had for a long time, that I made a very bad career choice about 30 odd years ago, you know. I mean, this is obviously where you needed to be. But what they still share in common, and you'll see it from the British stuff, is on the main street, in the main street. Smaller banks can't lend. Small businesses are being squeezed. Unemployment's at really ter terrible levels. People are pressed beyond financially. Um, and unemployment and underemployment seem to be uh, really, really locked in. So they, in the end, I think this financial crisis, even in its first phase, has left a deep scar on both societies. And what partly distresses me, 
is that politically the country two systems do have this other terrible difference in that inside the American political system there is a strong libertarian tradition yeah. so people just literally talk about pulling the government out and shutting the Fed down and whereas if you say that in England they will take you off to a state run psychiatric hospital <laughs> to recover you know because it is by any standards insane we have a political system in the United States where the, the lunatics are trying to take over the asylum and they might so we have a political problem here to get people to behave in any kind of civilized fashion. What's sad in the European case is you have strong centre-right governments who are used to using the state for economic purposes and centre-left governments that are supposed to use them for civilised and benign ones and they are also chasing this austerity uh, rabbit down the hole. And so the danger of both political systems for different reasons prolonging this recession is, I think, my final thought to you. I spent yesterday, as I was saying to, to, to two as I came in, I spent yesterday teaching Japan and Japanese post war Japanese economy. And of course, people now do talk about this one year, de one lost decade, but of course, Japan lost two decades. And Japan's still stuck 19 years since the Japan uh, got stopped growing. You know, I don't wish, you, but this is really important, it's really important for you because your adult life, the first half of your adult life, could be completely screwed by these bankers if we don't do something about it. So we need to just just mention that in passing. Uh, you know, if, and if anybody can think of a good solution, please let me know. You know, because then we need it. So that's what I wanted to show you: the way in which these two econ two critical economies that came through a common crisis in a slightly different fashion. But I just wanted to, us to close by making the the point that this thing is still going on around us. So who? Where did we start the housing papers? We started them at the back, I think, didn't we? So the, for the for people at the front, who's is anybody sitting there with a piece of information about the UK housing system, uh, the state of the housing market that they could share with everybody? Is there any kind of housing crisis left in the United States, Kingdom now? Please, do let, let us know. Chuck, have you got one? Claire them. Come on, Claire. Spread, spread the misery. <laughs> hmm? Nothing good, no, tell us. The, the, the title uh, on this one, this is from August, of Housing Market Set for a Chilly Autumn. Yeah, it's definitely not heading anywhere good with um, falls, property data showing falls. Well, people will have consumer data there, won't they? What's happening to people's levels of personal consumption in the UK? Are they going up or going down? Going down. Going down. They're seriously going down. I mean, there are pockets in, in, in our housing market where property prices have gone up again. You know, sections of London, for example, can be because the demand is so high. And one of the things that the Cameron government is currently doing is actually cutting the subsidies to social housing and rent subsidies. And that's having the effect, as, as more people are moving into the rented sector because they can't afford to buy a house, rents are going up then the poor can't get into the rented sector because they don't get the, the subsidies have actually been rolled down. Now, before this crisis began, they produced this fabulous figure, which anybody who lives in Washington, D.C. will know is true, that, there was, that they have about 650 towns and cities in the U.K., I think, to be above a certain size, you know, um, and in something like 480 of them, houses were beyond the purchasing capacity of first-generation teachers, policemen, firefighters and ambulance drivers, which means that the very basic services that people rely on in moments of crisis, the people providing them couldn't live in the towns in which they were providing them. And so we're having to commute in to do the job and then go out. So, I mean, don't be poor in London right now. I mean, it's just not a good idea, you know, because actually you won't be able to afford housing the transport costs of getting to work will probably take away most of what you're living on and so on. There is, and you, we saw the figures here. There's 15.1 million people, aren't there, officially living in poverty in the United States now. You know, it's back to 1998 levels. So at the bottom of the system, this thing is having real consequences. I think. Has anybody got anything else on the housing side? A very modest lot, my love. Oh, I love reading newspapers out loud. It beats listening to me, I think. Um, any more? Well, yeah. article that it's a think tank in the UK and it just uh, 
they say that the inflation will undermine any possible price rises and they're predicting the house prices will keep falling for the next five years. Yeah. So more and more people are going to go on work. And if you bought the top of the bottom, right about there. Now, there's also, isn't there economic data out there? Is, is the UK economy booming right now? No. no. They, they revised it down to 1.1, haven't they? So again, you've got this economy that's stuck. <clears throat> and if you believe that economies get stuck, private economies get stuck because of the weight of the public sector on them, and obviously an austerity budget that'll take the public sector away will release green shoots of private economic growth, won't it? But if on the other hand you believe you've got a private sector whose confidence level in demand is so low that if you start cutting public spending you actually take it down, then you can double dip this economy overnight. You know? Now, I, you know, it's, it, I suppose it's a fair choice, but to me it looks like a choice between sanity and madness. You know, I mean, I think, I, I, I do not understand how anybody, and the IMF is saying this too, I mean, how anybody can be seriously believing, if they talk to any small business person, that the thing that's actually in the way right now is regulation or government spending or whatever, what's actually in the way is the inability of the banks to lend you money. And even if they would, your fear that if you, if you, if you use it, you won't get it back because people don't have the money to buy. And if you tax cut economies like ours now, the chances, chances are that people will use it to lower their level of personal debt. They won't use it to spend. You know, so in fact, you know, the tax cutting that part of this package is likely to not to generate a huge response anyway. And this isn't rocket science. I, you know, I just you, we seem to have political classes in both countries it, that have got themselves hermetically sealed inside neoclassical economics. Um, so that would be my other personal solution to the advancement of the human condition: would be to shut economics departments for a decade. That would, that if we shut them for a decade then they can come back and we'll have wonderful economic growth. <laughs> okay, we quit? Questions, comments? Um, do you think that the, um, with the crises, <coughs> especially in England, because they've always been sort of a more tentative member of the EU, do you think it's kind of kind of drive them away more? Yeah, I'm sure it would drive them away. I mean, it's a very hard case to sell to join the Eurozone right now. Um, I mean, I've been a complete Euro fanatic myself. I've been advocating for years. I need to get in, you know, for part of the <coughs> But I think now is not the time to do that. In fact, Cameron went to the UN and was quietly telling them what to do. I don't know if you saw that. You know, he has, the other guy has balls. You know, I mean, you know, you know, the, the Eurozone has its own internal issue to settle about how far it gets a common fiscal policy and how far it does live up to its commitments to for even economic growth. And it's very, I can see it's very hard for German Christian Democrats to deliver on that front. But nonetheless, you know, they don't need Cameron's help, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, but they, but they, won't, they will, it'll keep them out. Yeah. And it would seem to vindicate Gordon Brown kept raising the bar. You know, Tony Blair, of course, was a great enthusiast for joining the European cur currency. Um, and because Tony Blair was in favor, I think Tony, Gordon Brown was against it. I mean, there was a bit serious, and they never did. Um, can you explain, I know you touched on it briefly earlier, quantitative easing a little more, just what the... What does it mean? Yeah, I just, yeah. I mean, I hear that all the time, but I'm not really sure what that... Well, it means that the Federal Reserve, or the Central Bank, simply says to the um, to, to lending institution that you can lend X, and we will underwrite it, and, and we will therefore, you know, create the money if we need to, uh, to guarantee any uh, debts that you accumulate in that way. So, um, they, <clears throat> what's happened in the in the housing market in the, in the US uh, uh, was that the Federal Reserve decided to buy up mortgage-backed securities in bulk from banks. It took them off their books and gave them money, which then they could then lend on. That was the whole idea, and they proposed it again yesterday, was it the day before, and they just did that little twist they'd done. Uh, it, but the trouble is the banks, the banks took the money, but they didn't lend it on. You know, so actually that, but so you didn't get as much quantitative easing as you thought. And the, um, it's funny actually how they differ each side of the water. And I just do think it's libertarian philosophy in the way. The British, um, I think it was a, the CBI, it wasn't the Institute of Directors, the CBI, the main employers organization, asked for greater quantitative easing last week. They said we need more 
the, the, the Bank of England has put more money into the system. Uh, and the numbers that they talk about, of course, are vast. But as long as central banks uh, are viable and support each other, then internally it's fine. That's not quantitative easing. Well, we used to call it monetary policy, actually, but that's quite quantitative easing. And, and it's not just monetary policy was you know, lowering interest rates. Right. And they're so low now. Yeah, well, that's what I was wondering. Is yeah, you just they're already down here. So you have to say to come, we, uh, you, you, the um, student loan body, right here, right? You can lend money to students, right, at a very low rate of interest, and we'll un underwrite it. So, that, uh, so that no sector of the economy escapes massive levels of personal debt. Um, yeah, my question is, uh, what extent do you think the lack of regulation actually? created this crisis. I took a class with Thomas Oatley in which he suggested that the, the, regulation, or the lack of regulation um, just exacerbated it, but it was something that was inevitable anyway because of the, I guess, price specie flow and the amount of money available in the international market to come back into our economy, that this, but, but due to the lack of regulation that it made it a lot worse than it could have been. Yeah. I think, I think both those things are true, actually. Uh, um, I mean, it's kind of mildly amusing that Bill Clinton lays claim you know, to making 24 million jobs. But of course that was all Japanese money flowing into the stock market and we had kind of stock market Keynesianism, didn't we? Colin Crouch brought it and I think that's absolutely right. But they did deregulate in like, remarkable ways and, and they got themselves, as, well, I'm sure if you read all the, there's such a literature now, isn't there, of the bank crisis, so many books that to be to fail and so on, they're making films of it. But one of the problems in the financial sector is that you can't get monopoly profits off financial instruments for very long because they're very, quite rapidly replicated. So you're continually having to get market share either by increasing volume or by inventing an even more um, complicated product. Now, you, the ability to do that and to expand into new areas depends on what rules surround A, the new products, and B, your fields of action. And of course, commercial banks and investment banks are supposed to be entirely separate until uh, Glass-Steagall was taken down uh, in the 90s at the behest of the banking industries and with the support of all the Clinton people, including Larry Sumner, who then turns up you know, in the Obama administration. So there's a lot of poachers in this, the turn gamekeeper. Um, and the, so the banks could, could do more. The banks wanted to do more. But the problem they had in relation to housing was because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were there as a secondary housing market, so the banks would, uh, 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 the brokers would pass their mortgages on to Fannie Mae and get the money back, right? And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had set this standard, this 30-year fully amortized mortgage, which you had to put a 20% deposit down. That had been the absolute gold standard. The banks had nothing to offer against that to kind of get more market share. And because the foreign investors uh, felt that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were effectively government-sponsored enterprises. They, you know, they wouldn't be allowed to fail. Buying their stuff was really easy, so they got lots of money coming in. So the banks then decided we better get more complicated stuff, and particularly let's offer easier kinds of mortgages. And out it went, you know. And of course, lots of people keen to live in a, your own private home when the government's paying a third of it off in tax. Why the hell are you renting, right? So there's a huge attempt to get in at the bottom. And the bank's keen to land, and then the bank's thinking, well, this might be a bit dodgy, you know, so um, why don't we take out some insurance, right? So, you, so the, the risks start to drift away to the one financial institution that's least risk averse or most stupid, whichever way you want to put it, right? Uh, on, uh, work on the premise that, well, the whole thing's never going to fall at the same time, and that's AIG, and it's holding the whole baby, you know, and then the whole damn thing falls to bits, and AIG has debts coming for billions of dollars, right? So that's, the, um, that's how the deregulation kind of be built in. And there's this other thing around this rational market hypothesis, it's this notion that you shouldn't regulate because the market will always find the rational price, the, the, the intellectual counterweight to Keynesianism. Well, of course, what happens, you get the Minsky effect, you know, this guy Minsky pointed out, you know, that what sets prices in a stock market are prices. You know, so you know, prices go down to every other body's price goes down because, you know, standing in the middle of the stock market on a Tuesday morning, you can't go back and check your corporate portfolio and the quality of the management and look at their market share and all the stuff you're supposed to do to be a rational investor. You think, bloody hell, the market's going to sell and the thing keeps going. So uh, 
American business schools, including the one at Wake Forest, teach this stuff to this day, you know, and I do literally think we should shut it, right? Because actually it is, it's like training people in how to poison people. No medical school would deliberately, I mean, well, they do accidentally, but, you know, but actually, they, well, actually we're a really good medical school because we can kill more people per square inch than you can, right? But you have business schools saying, come on, we'll make you more stupid than any other. Uh, and lots and lots of uh, banks now are not by, are not recruiting from business schools where this stuff is taught. But I have a whole generation of right-wing colleagues, that's all they know. you know, And they're not going to give it up. So I think these things all came together. It took the internal dynamo of uh, financial speculation. But as you said right at the beginning, this, sorry, my long answer, the flow of money in was critical. Absolutely critical. If you've got no money, you have as much dynamo as you want. As in, I'm sure you're aware, within the last year, there's been a dramatic uptick, uptick in the um, commodities market. You know, in certain cases, they've gone up 200 percent. Cotton, for example. Now, hypothetically speaking, setting aside negative uh, consequences, let's say we were able to engineer a 15 percent, uh, 15 uh, percentage point drop across the board within the commodities market. Mm -hmm. What kind of relief would the civil societies and states, both in the United States and England, see? I would think a lot, because all it would do is take money away from commodity producers who tend not to be in the industrialized north, don't they? I mean, it's, well, Norway wouldn't like it, would they? Because, I mean, they need the oil, right? And, uh, and uh, the British, I think, are still, aren't they, just about oil, oil, oil uh, uh, sufficient? But in general, I mean, it points to what is the underlying thing, isn't it? That the whole welfare systems of Western Europe were put together in the post-war period when the Cold War closed out half the global labor force and left the third world to starve. And now we've got ourselves into a situation where you know, the Asian peasantry is mobilizing, you know, demand is rising, and those kinds of terms of trade, of course, are totally gone. So we're having to configure a new social settlement in the north that recognizes that levels of demand for basic commodities are going to be extraordinarily high. And I think that, you know, that, that to find that settlement they keep saying free trade is the answer to everything. Well, you know, no, I'm not sure it isn't. You know, you know, unless you want to watch uh, commodity prices soar, people actually shut down welfare states in the north because they haven't got the petrol to go to the hospital. You know, I mean, the kinds of things are really, really going to impact people's lives. The pr and in the, it, I know it doesn't play out quite the same way in the United Kingdom, does it? But here, if gas prices get to a certain level, people then people keep going to those Protestant churches who believe the end of the world's coming, you know, because gas prices are full of $4, so Jesus must be here by Friday week, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> That's the terrifying thing about the South, isn't it? But in, the, in Western Europe's kind of got more immune, hasn't it, the Brits, to paying for their health care through the petrol pump. But, but I talked to my brother, who's fairly right of centre, just like the right of Genghis Khan, actually. And he gets very, very cross, you know, that petrol prices in the UK. That's good that way, but I say that's a product, isn't it? Of China, really. Okay, I'm on more chunk. Uh, <clears throat> it's more jelly. Do you think that uh, because of the current crisis in housing in America, that young people our age now are less likely to buy a house ever because we have less confidence that it's going to be a sound investment? I don't think I think that. Um, I think um, what will determine that is whether um, the tax codes remain as they are. The tax codes in the form they are now, um, then getting into the housing market still remains a good idea. And one, this the dominant housing policy, I think even the Obama Boomer administration, is to try and get the house you know, through the thing, get the more house prices are coming down. So actually, you know, Sadly, it's a good time to buy, you know, if you've got the money. Um, but you better get on with it, you know. Um, the trouble is, you go to the bank, <laughs> they won't lend it you, you know, <laughs> because you, until you get a job. But if you get a job that you think is going to be stable for a while, then I think that we may get to a point where you do want to get in. I mean, what happened with the house explosion was it was a transfer of resource between generations, wasn't it? You know. My generation, baby boomers. Are